As you can see, for the title of this next talk is uh, Bugs, Guts, uh, and Butts, Liver Disease and the Intestinal Microbiome. Um, I don't have any commercial disclosures. My main disclosure is that I'm not an expert in autoimmune hepatitis as a, you know, um, a, di a disease topic. I'm a clinical gastroenterologist by training, but I have a research interest in the microbiome. And so I was hoping to share a little bit about what we know about the intestinal microbiome and how that relates to liver disease and obviously autoimmune hepatitis as well. Um, and again, this is meant to be relatively informal, so if you do have questions along the way, uh, feel free to stop me, otherwise um, we'll have, you know, hopefully time for questions at the end as well. Okay. So, you know, if we want to start talking about the microbiome, I think it's helpful to um, kind of start with the basics of what, what do we mean when, we, when we're referring to the microbiome. So uh, the microbiome can exist in multiple sites in our body, but for the interests of today, we're really focusing on the gut microbiome or the GI microbiome. And we know that as humans, our guts uh, house a very complex community of microorganisms. And generally, these microorganisms include bacteria, which comprise a large uh, section of that, and then fungi and viruses. Um, in general, we exist in a mutualistic relationship with the bugs that inhabit our intestine. And when we talk about these microbial members of this community that lives in our gut and all of their genetic content, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the microbiome, um, similar to when we refer to like the human genome. So microbiome is the genetic material of all the microbial organisms that live uh, amongst and within us. Uh, in the human intestine alone, there's up to 100 trillion microorganisms, and that outnumbers our own human body cells by at least 10. So if you think about it, that's really a massive, um, massive community. And uh, it's a living community, so, and it's a functional community. So one um, way that you can think of it is that it's almost a microbial organ um, that lives within a host organ, so um, the host being our gut. And because it's functional and it's live, the, the microbes or the microorganisms actually carry out a number of important biological processes within our body. And I'll go into this a little bit more in detail in a subsequent slide, but um, you know, just, just for a brief overview, these microorganisms help to consume, redistribute, uh, store energy. They also help influence a lot of biochemical processes or biochemical transformations in our own bodies and essentially they, uh, because it's like this uh, additional organ, it really does expand the functional capacity of our own bodies. What um, shapes the microbiome? How does it get to be where it is? Uh, so there's a number of different factors that can influence uh, the microbial community and what uh, shapes uh, the microbiota in our gut. And I've listed off, you can see on this slide here, um, you know, this can include early life events, uh, birth mode, uh, genetics, obviously, um, your sex, uh, your age, what you eat, even just your basic GI function and your, your physiology affects what types of organisms tend to grow, um, medications that you take, all of these things can affect uh, the microbiome. And then obviously other environmental and personal factors like your hygiene, where you live, um, physical activity, smoking, alcohol use, even psychological stress, which I know has been a topic that's been discussed at this meeting. So um, the assembly of the microbiome uh, begins pretty soon after birth. So um, in utero, we you know, have these uh, sterile guts, and then as the baby's born, they're quickly colonized by typically what they're exposed to first, and that's why birth mode can sometimes be important. You know, was it um, you know, uh, standard vaginal delivery or a C-section? These things can affect you know, what the baby is exposed to the first time, and then quickly they uh, undergo exposure to certain key life events, whether that's um, you know, introduction of solid foods and medications and and the microbiome of a, a young child will quickly converge into what we consider this adult-like microbiome. And an adult-like microbiome is, is pretty stable over time, and it's actually, even though it's a very diverse community, it's uh, relatively resilient. It's able to resist really drastic shifts in the community, even um, when it's subjected to specific insults and exposures. And then, you know, when you get to the um, opposite extreme at the very, you know, um, 
older stages of life, we do, we have observed that the diversity and possibly the stability of the microbiome tends to decrease again. So the other thing that, um, you know, is interesting to think about is the microbiome is, is not the same in all parts of the GI tract. This, this does change as we go from higher to lower down in the gut. Um, generally speaking, you have more bacteria lower down in your gut than you do higher up in your gut. Um, and this is because there are a number of factors that can influence the types and the amounts of bacteria or microorganisms that can grow in certain areas. In the stomach, there's gastric acids, there's um, fluid secretions, different enzymes that can affect what types of microorganisms can thrive. Uh, transit or the movement of contents is generally faster in the small intestine than it is in the colon. So again, that also affects uh, how the community thrives. And um, this is just a general figure here outlining some major groups that are found in certain sections of the intestine as you move from higher to lower. And up to this point, most of our knowledge of the bacteria that grow in our gut has come from what we've been able to grow in the lab. So we take specimens from people and we actually culture them out and grow them in the lab and then we can identify what types of bacteria there are. But um, now when we talk about microbiota and microbiome, we're generally referring to our increased ability and scientific capacity to study these communities. We're not so much limited to what we can grow in the lab anymore. Studying this population of microorganisms, if you think about it, is inherently challenging because it's so vast and it's so complex. And at the turn of the century, so around two, 2000 or so, there was um, the advent of what we call the, the genomics era. So some of you may be familiar with the concept of sequencing the human genome. That was big news back in 2000, 2001. And those techniques have now been applied to try to study the microbiome. So essentially what we're doing is we're applying techniques where we can look at the genetic material or we look at the DNA and that gives us um, an outline or you know, a clue as to who we think is, is there. So this really expands our ability to identify organisms and we can look for massive numbers of organisms without being limited to what we can actually grow in the lab. So there's a lot of different ways you can study um, genetic material. One of the uh, techniques that you may hear of more frequently is something called 16S rRNA sequencing. Um, again, that's a research term, but what that refers to is sequencing of a specific gene. So sequencing is when you're basically identifying the DNA code for a certain organism. And it's almost like forensics, you know, when you, when you go and you're looking at a crime scene and, and you're trying to see who was there by looking for their DNA. So we're essentially doing that with, microbiome, uh, with the microbiome. And what we use is we use this target gene, 16S rRNA, and this is present in all bacteria, and that's why this is a good marker gene. And there's a little bit of variability from one organism to another, and so what we do is we look for these variations, and we can map it back to some sort of huge reference database that scientists have been accumulating over the years. And based on um, what the 16S, uh, what the 16S rRNA gene looks like, we can identify the type of microorganism that was there. So this is a really useful tool. It does have some limitations. Again, it's much more comprehensive or encompassing than something like culture, growing something in the lab. But it just it tells you uh, who was there. It doesn't necessarily tell you what they were doing. Just like if you look at a crime scene, you find someone's DNA. There's evidence that they were there. Did they actually perpetrate the crime? Hard to know. It's, it's, it's basically just um, an ID. And then, um, again, even though the 16S rRNA gene is present in all bacteria, this technique can't always be used to identify every single bacteria, number one, because of the number of organisms there are. We just haven't referenced every type of bacteria there is. And um, some bacteria just, are, just don't, this gene doesn't sequence quite as well. Um, but overall, it's a good tool, it's a useful tool, and it's something that you may hear of quite frequently, especially in the scientific community. Okay, so now we've got some novel tools to look at the microbiome and the microbiota. Um, what do we know about why you know, this is important to health and disease? So I mentioned this before. So under normal healthy circumstances, the relationship between us and our microorganisms is considered to be mutually beneficial. 
The microorganisms that live in the gut help us by breaking down nutrients. They can actually provide us with additional energy by breaking down nutrients that we can't normally digest. Um, again, they influence and regulate uh, energy storage. They also regulate the immune system in both positive, potentially negative ways when we're talking about diseases. And um, they can have direct and indirect effects on the function of our gastrointestinal tracts or our guts. In general, diversity in this community, if you think about it, um, you think about global population, diversity is felt to be beneficial. Um, this helps maintain uh, sustainability and uh, stability, and it also helps maintain functional capacity because you don't just want one or a few select groups. You want a, a diverse group that can do a lot of different things. When we talk about some sort of disruption in this equilibrium, this is what we uh, refer to when you hear the term dysbiosis. This might come up sometimes if you're reviewing you know, medical literature. And this disequilibrium or dysbiosis has been associated um, with a number of disease states and could potentially be uh, a marker or even a driver of disease. So why is the microbiome so um, particularly interesting with uh, you know, uh, the liver? And you know, I, I wanted to bring this up because um, in, in addition to autoimmune hepatitis, abnormalities in the GI or the gut microbiome have actually been linked to a number of chronic or long-term liver diseases, um, and then also end-stage liver disease, such as cirrhosis, and then other complications of liver disease. And I've listed off a few additional liver diseases that have been correlated with what we call abnormal microbiomes. And the, the liver is actually a really interesting model for this because we know that there is this direct crosstalk between the gut and the liver. So um, it's called this gut-liver axis. It's incompletely understood, but generally speaking, the liver is kind of the first organ that receives a lot of the um, metabolites and substrates produced by the gut because uh, what happens is, you know, what, you, what occurs here in the gut uh, gets taken up by what we call the portal vein if you're familiar with the anatomy. So the portal circulation takes things back to the liver and a normal healthy liver helps um, metabolize and filter out and use these substrates. And then the liver itself uh, secretes uh, factors into the bile ducts and the bile ducts are directly uh, you know, emptied into uh, the gut. So there's really this tight connection between the gut and the liver. So gut health and liver health are, are um, closely intertwined. It's an axis that's not completely understood, uh, but we do know it's there. Um, and then obviously there's what we call the systemic circulation or the blood flow throughout the body that is again related to this communication between the gut and the liver. So when we talk about um, how the microbiome is important in liver disease, one of the more, um, I think, extreme examples that you can use to think about this is cirrhosis. So um, for those of you who are familiar with it, uh, so cirrhosis is considered to be end-stage liver disease. It can occur with a number of different liver conditions, but it's where you start to lose the healthy liver cells and there's development of scarring in these regenerative nodules and the liver just isn't working quite as well as it normally should. Um, and almost every type of liver disease, if it progresses far enough, could potentially um, turn into cirrhosis. So, you know, this is an important uh, process to understand. Abnormal microbiomes or dysbiosis have been linked to cirrhosis as well as complications of cirrhosis. I think one great example of this is our historical understanding of something called hepatic encephalopathy. So for those who aren't familiar with this, hepatic encephalopathy is a medical condition that describes decline in brain function. And this can happen with cirrhosis and historically we've understood this as there are toxins that are produced um, uh, in the body that normally get filtered out by a healthy liver. But in a cirrhotic liver where the function um, just isn't quite as good, some of these toxins leak out, get back into the bloodstream and then make their way up to the brain and it affects brain function and um, can cause symptoms like confusion and trouble sleeping and a host of other um, different types of symptoms. And one of the classic toxins is uh, considered to be ammonia. It may not be the only one, but it's a big factor and ammonia is produced by the bacteria in the gut. So we've known about hepatic encephalopathy for a long time. We, um, when people suffer from this, we generally treat it by trying to clear out the gut with medications like lactulose and then sometimes we even use antibiotics. So this is a um, one specific model of how 
the bacteria in the gut can actually lead to complications of liver disease. When we're looking now using our more sophisticated tools to look at microbial composition um, and this huge community of gut microbes, we have, you know, there have been numerous studies that have looked at what happens in patients who have cirrhosis. And I've listed off a few examples here. I don't want to get into too many of the details because, again, this is kind of in the early stages of research. But in um, one study that was published a few years ago among um, uh, Chinese patients with alcoholic and hepatitis-associated cirrhosis, it was found that there seemed to be increased levels of certain oral bacteria further along down the gut when they compared that to people who didn't have these conditions. Um, in a separate study, there um, was another um, uh, research investigation published that reported that there are actually overgrowth or overrepresentation of specific bacteria higher up in the gut when you looked at patients with cirrhosis versus those without. Um, and then most recently, another interesting study that I saw um, that had been recently published were that there, there could be an imbalance or there is an imbalance between the ratios of bacteria and fungi in the gut. Now again, whether this is just a marker of disease, whether it's a target for treatment, whether it's a cause or a consequence, it's really hard to tell at this point, but we do know that the, there are these associations. So it is something important, it's something to keep our attention to and um, keep you know, trying to understand. I want to talk about a few other different disease processes um, because all of these are kind of linked in a way. Um, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, many of you may be familiar with this, but it is the most, actually the most common liver disease in Western countries now. And uh, the microbiome has been studied in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And again, using our uh, novel techniques, what they've reported is that there are changes in gut bacteria in fatty liver disease. And you know, the, the hypothesis here is you get an imbalance here in the microbial population. And these microbes can directly affect uh, the gut barrier function. And you get transport of bacterial factors and other inflammatory factors that make it across the gut and into the, the bloodstream or into the circulation, potentially the portal circulation. Um, these microbes can also digest uh, nutrients selectively. In some cases, they may even digest uh, nutrients that are important for health, like choline, and there's less choline available for the body. Um, and sometimes they can also produce substances that would be considered toxic or not helpful, for example, you know, um, low levels of ethanol. All of these things can get back to the liver through that uh, gut liver access and potentially promote inflammation. Um, so for example, you've got a liver with some fat in it and then you have these other factors that are driving more and more inflammation. This in, in some individuals can take the liver to an inflammatory state and if you know, insult and injury continue, in a small subset of patients, some, some individuals will develop cirrhosis. Primary biliary cholangitis is another example of a totally different liver disease that can be affected by the microbiome. Again, some of you may be familiar with this because um, in some cases you can have PBC and autoimmune hepatitis overlap. You can actually have a little bit of both. Um, PBC is defined as like this inflammatory condition that affects the bile ducts. And this occurs within the liver and then in some cases can lead to scarring and cirrhosis. And this is just another example of where changes in the microbiome um, could potentially uh, contribute to inflammation. Um, again, the process here is that the microbes in the organism could, um, microorganisms in the gut could produce products and uh, specific bacteria could actually you know, travel up to the gut and ascend up the bile ducts and promote this immune attack on the bile ducts. And there was actually a study that was done here, um, the IU group, a small study that looked at PBC patients who had advanced disease versus PBC patients who had less advanced disease or early disease. And when we looked at the stool microbiome, we just got stool samples, what we found is that in those who had advanced disease, they had a significant decrease in um, the species richness. So they had less diversity than those people who had more advanced uh, disease. And when we looked at the communities, we could kind of see a separation in their profiles. And this is, again, important. Is this uh, a consequence of progressive liver disease? Is it associated with driving the disease? Uh, too early to tell, but we do know there is a difference. Liver cancer, um, again, this is relevant to all types of liver diseases because uh, you know anyone um, with liver disease, if they um, just kind of 
experience the right hits or they progress along the right pathway, a small subset of patients can go on to develop liver cancer. And the microbiome has been studied in liver cancer as well, and it's felt to potentially have an important role. So for example, you've got various different types of liver conditions here, again, that could be driven by the microbiome. Um, you've got deterioration in liver function, you can develop cirrhosis, and again, the gut microbiome could be um, integral to promoting or uh, um, contributing to progression and the health of the liver. So uh, bacteria can actually, again, make their way to the liver, bacterial factors can get transported to the liver, and in some cases it's unknown, but uh, mostly studied in animal models at this point, not so much in humans, but there seem to be potential for certain microbes that could release tumor promoting factors that then make it into the liver and promote the development of hepatocellular cancer or liver cancer. The last example I want to get into before we get into AIH is alcoholic liver disease. Um, again, uh, long-term alcohol use can lead to progressive liver disease, and in some, some individuals that causes liver disease with inflammation, and in other uh, individuals that it could just lead to you know, fat deposition in the liver without so much uh, inflammation or deterioration in liver function. And again, um, this intestinal dysbiosis has been studied in alcohol, uh, alcoholic liver disease. And interestingly, we do see differences in um, patients with alcohol abuse versus patients without. And this is, can actually only be partially reversed even when you take the alcohol away or you try to treat with things like probiotics. Um, some researchers have promoted that there's a decrease in fungal diversity. So again, it may not just be just the bacteria. We have to think about other organisms. And alcohol itself um, can have important effects on the gut barrier, can promote inflammation, can either alter some of the bioactive compounds that are circulating in the body, and this can, again, take you from a normal liver to a liver with fat, to a liver with fat with inflammation and scarring and then cirrhosis and then obviously complications of long-term liver disease such as liver cancer. Um, stool transplant is actually being explored as a research tool for the treatment of alcoholic liver disease. And again, the thought here is that by um, targeting the microbiome, we may be able to achieve some sort of therapeutic benefit. Again, I, I do want to emphasize that this is in the early stages of research, and we really need to design and um, carry out some really uh, carefully um, constructed clinical studies to determine if this is actually going to be useful and how to apply it, but this is uh, one area that uh, we are interested in looking at. Okay, so um, we've talked about different examples of liver disease in the microbiome. Um, how does that relate to autoimmune hepatitis? So autoimmune hepatitis, um, as you're probably all familiar with, is considered to be this immune-driven inflammatory liver disease, and all the, the exact cause is unclear. Again, there are a number of factors that could be involved, uh, breakdown in immune tolerance, environment, genetics, so forth. How does the gut microbiome play a role? So we know that the gut microbiome is so important in regulating our own physiology. Again, in autoimmune hepatitis, what may be occurring is that the gut microbiome could potentially augment these immune responses. Um, could contribute to this overcoming of normal tolerance that occurs in, um, you know, individuals who are at risk of this disease. And then um, could uh, components of the microbiome actually stimulate the immune system or trigger the autoimmune response. And again, it's such a vast and complex community. It serves as this, as this reservoir of different factors and cells that can aggravate and potentially drive this autoimmune condition. This was a study that was published a, a, just a few years ago looking at autoimmune hepatitis in the microbiome. And what they found interestingly was that certain groups of bacteria, uh, particularly something called bifidobacterium and lactobacillus, were decreased in patients who had autoimmune hepatitis compared to uh, patients who did not. And again, um, you can see kind of um, declines based on how, how bad their liver disease was. Interestingly, when we look at animal models, germ-free mice are relatively protected against autoimmune hepatitis. And we don't know why that is, but it's possibly due to the fact that the lack of bacteria or bacterial factors um, isn't there to help drive an immune process that, uh, go ahead. I was just curious what a germ-free mouse is. What a germ-free mouse is? Good question. So a germ-free mouse is basically um, a mouse that's uh, raised in a lab and um, they're, they're delivered typically via C-section and then they're, they're kept in a sterile environment. So they're um, 
um, bodies and their guts don't actually develop uh, microbes or and they so it's it's a good scientific model um, I do want to emphasize that mice and humans are completely different. <laughs> so um, what happens in mice doesn't obviously always translate into humans, but it's a good starting point for us to try to pinpoint specific pathways. So a germ-free mouse is one of those models that we do use to try to study the microbiome. Excellent question. Okay, so um, kind of getting towards the end here. Now, now we know that the microbiome is important. We know that it can um, contribute to disease. What can we do? So how, how is this important for us? What can we do to try to apply this to therapy? Well, there are a number of different ways that we can manipulate the microbiome. We can try to adjust uh, dietary factors. Um, administration of probiotics, as you're probably all aware, is something that's been heavily studied. Um, supplements like vitamin A, obviously the use of antibiotics. Um, can we recolonize or can we transplant different microbiotas? How, what can we do to improve the intestinal barrier? Um, potentially pharmacologic agents or medications can be used for this. Uh, short chain fatty acids, which are normally produced by bacteria in our body, could also be applied to try to promote intestinal health. These are all things that are currently being studied to try to use as therapeutic options. Um, but is this ready right now for clinical use? Um, I think we have to try to maintain some clarity about this. So um, we know that manipulating the microbiota may be a next step, but we have to be careful because um, we do know that this can still have adverse consequences and we have to know what we're doing. We have to really balance the potential benefits of changing the microbiota with potential risks. Again, like I emphasized in the first few slides, the microbiota uh, performs many essential and important functions in our own bodies. Um, so we don't want to just uh, go in there too aggressively and, and create drastic shifts where we don't know what the long-term consequences may be. Again, antibiotics are commonly used, but um, again, we have to use it for the right indications. There's always a small risk that antibiotic use could actually favor the rise of certain organisms we don't want to grow out um, or other organisms that could be suited to further stimulate or drive the immune system. So as of now, we're still working on trying to understand the specific components of the microbiota, how that contributes to disease processes, which are the pathways that we can try to target, what can we change without um, causing adverse consequences. So um, you know, these ideal therapies are yet uncertain. Which organisms do we need to focus on? How long do we need to apply therapy? The, the population in the gut is a result of so many different factors. What can we do to sufficiently and adequately adjust or change the microbiome in, in one individual person. So in summary, I just want to leave you with this. The gut microbiota, remember, is a complex community of microorganisms that reside in our bodies, uh, important to health and survival. Dysbiosis is observed in numerous uh, disease states and in um, AIH and may be particularly important in AIH because of the relationship between the microbiome and the immune system. Um, the abnormal shifts in the microbiota could contribute to inflammation and to immunological processes that drive the progression of AIH. Again, this is something that really needs to be studied. It's um, an area where there are some research investigations that have been published, but not a whole lot of data. So um, this is, again, something that we um, are interested in pursuing. So further clarifying how our microbiota drives disease still requires extensive research so that we can improve our understanding and eventually develop what we would consider cutting edge techniques. Um, in the future, so a quote from uh, Frederick Back uh, Backhead and his colleagues and um, some experts in the field of the microbiome, just as microbiotas have co-evolved with their animal hosts, this field must co-evolve with its academic hosts and their ability to devise innovative ways of assembling interactive and interdisciplinary research groups that are necessary to advance our understanding. And investigating the microbiome specifically in AIH could result in the discovery of new bacterial factors that are involved in the disease and eventually lead to therapies that could eliminate these factors that drive or sustain the process. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a point to doing that because we don't have a way you know, right. to treat or Yeah, yeah. I think um, you know, the commercial tests that are currently available to study microbiome are still too premature. Um, I don't think that most clinicians, um, even most researchers, will know what to do with that information yet. And you don't want to act on something that you you don't understand fully. Um, but I think, you know, we um, you know, it's good that we have these tools. It's kinda like
I liken it to history, you know. Sometimes we have the tools before we know how to use them. Um, so you just have to keep that in mind. But good question. So is there a current study going on about like specifically AIH? AIH. Um, so uh, there are probably um, uh, studies going on at other institutions at uh, IU specifically. I don't know that we have a microbiota-based study for AIH, but Dr. Lammert may um, may have the details on that. Clinical trials. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, they should have details. If you click on the link, they should have details about each individual trial. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so they, they did find that bifidobacterium and lactobacillus were lower in AIH. And again, whether or not this is just a reflection of the disease process, how you know a diseased liver contributes to gut population, or if the gut population is becoming altered and making the liver more prone to disease, um, still not certain. But we do know that there are certain groups that definitely appear to be uh, declined or suppressed and that there are certain bacterial factors and even antibodies that are higher in AIH. Okay. So it would be good to get those um, bacteria back in the probiotics. Yeah, so again, that's the question. Um, whether or not trying to administer probiotics and restoring any balance would be um, useful, we don't know yet. And I think that's where a clinical research trial, you know, again, probiotics have a very low risk of harm. Um, so I think that's actually an area that really would be well suited to study um, because we have to be able to answer that question. Does that make a difference? Can we, can we alter that? Can, can we, um, by applying some changes in diet and supplements, can, can we do things that make a difference in the disease? Yeah, so... Right, so um, scarring or fibrosis can kind of occur within the liver and when you start getting what they call bridging fibrosis and the scarring starts to really connect to each other and create these nodules, that's where, um, that's where we get into cirrhosis. So it's kind of, it's the extent of scarring. So when you have pretty extensive scarring, higher levels of fibrosis, that's generally what we define as cirrhosis. So it's a continuum, it's not necessarily black and white. So scarring is just kind of a scar control. Yeah, yeah. You can have a little bit of fibrosis in the development of some dark scar tissue that's not taken over the whole liver yet. Um, and so that's why we sometimes when they do liver biopsies, they're looking at how much fibrosis is there. Yes. If we wanted to read more about the microbiome or the microbiota and, and what it's functioning, yeah. where do we go to look? So I, th I th that's a great question. So where I go to look is, um, you know, I generally search for the medical journals because I, I like to look at and see what the scientists are publishing. There are probably some good community forums out there too, but again, the caveat with that is um, you don't know who is, who is writing, what their level of expertise is. But I think this is a topic that can be hard to navigate because most of the data that's being published by it, it's by the scientific experts, and trying to translate that into interpretable knowledge can be really challenging. But I often go to something like PubMed. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank yeah. You. So what about um, um, how close is the um, correlation between the uh, unhealthy microbiome and uh, fatigue versus AIH yeah. and fatigue? That's a great question. I think that's actually probably something that, again, needs to be studied in a research study because fatigue, I think, is poorly understood in a lot of liver diseases, um, and AIH included. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if we're going to start looking at the microbiome and AIH, what we need to do is look at complications of AIH and the microbiome as well because different components of this population may be um, contributing to different effects of the disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I think that's really the holy grail of microbiome research, being to understand if we can get a snapshot of someone's profile, um, understanding what's important and what we can do about it would be where we where we want to go. Again, this is we're probably multiple steps away from that. Just like if the human genome, right? We could get the all the genetic in information about a human, but what to act on and what all of that means is still really challenging for us because it's so much information. Some of it may never pan out to cause any problem, and there may be a few blips along the way that are, are the most important. And same with the microbiome, we have to be able to really understand that. But eventually, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think right now, um, you know, like I said, then, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I think that's actually, I think that's the really frustrating and also, you know, kind of the thought stimulating area of this field. Um, probiotics have been, like I said, heavily studied, but we have not really studied systematically individual probiotics or individual strains or formulations. So it's hard for, you know, doctors, clinicians um, to really recommend a specific probiotic. And there's so many on the market yeah. that are just not regulated. Yeah. Um, and in a way, it's almost considered like a dietary supplement in a way. So, um, um, again, the liver sees a lot of what the gut sees, um, but most, you know, benign things don't really cause too much of a problem. Um, yeah, you know, thinking about what you can do about diet and, um, you know, again, this really depends on the disease process because there may be certain, for example, disease processes where you want to increase uh, some dietary products like short-chain fatty acids which come from uh, carbohydrates and fibers. And there may be other disease processes where you want to, you know, um, push that down just a little bit. So um, specific dietary changes for something like AIH, again, probably needs to be really followed in, this, in the context of a clinical study because um, there's so many pathways involved that it's, it's really hard to say, oh, there's this one dietary substrate that you can consume and, again, um, that will suppress the immune uh, trigger or help the liver heal. Mm -hmm. um, but diet needs to be considered when we're, when we're thinking about um, microbiome. Mm -hmm. um, and then also with probiotics, what I tell people, so I'm a gastroenterologist, I see a lot of people with irritable bowel syndrome. Sure. What I tell people is if you find a probiotic that you're doing well on, um, I'm not worried about it really causing too much harm, but um, the, the main issue is cost, right? Um, are you paying for it and you're not sure if it's doing anything? If you feel like it's helpful, if you feel better overall, I, I tell people it's probably safe to continue it and if you feel that it's worth, worth the money. But um, we just don't have a good evidence, scientific evidence base to tell us exactly what it's doing. Um, and if, if you're not sure, I'd say just stop it for now mm -hmm. until we can actually study a specific probiotic and, and find out which ones would be helpful for you. And I think possibly in AIH, um, you may, we may need to even be more cautious because AIH patients are also on a lot of sometimes immunosuppression medications and we know that there's this dysregulation of the immune system. So even though the risk of probiotics uh, is very, very low, mm -hmm. there could theoretically be a risk if you're introducing you know, certain organisms in someone who has a deranged immune system or if they're um, immunosuppressed. So I say, you know, don't go crazy with it. Yeah. Um, but at the point, you know, we want you to be exposed to diverse things, a diverse diet, um, promote, you know, diversity and health within the gut. Mm -hmm. And then eventually maybe we can try to study specific strains or find out which strains might be helpful for which individual patient. Um, I don't think a probiotic, I don't think it's going to be one probiotic fits all. I really think that this is, you know, going to be individualized to the, to the patient. Yeah, so um, sometimes we do, there have been some studies that have looked at antibiotics, um, antibiotic use for liver disease, and actually there are some conditions, for example, um, 
I think PSC was one study where it was published where people actually did better after antibiotic treatment. And again, um, antibiotics have been used for complications of liver disease. And you know that's a really good model to study how affecting the microbiome can affect the liver. Um, but again, uh, I think the point here is that we don't know if we may potentially be killing off good bacteria too. Um, if something is so imbalanced and we really need to get you know, rid of some obvious pathogenic uh, bacteria, antibiotics, I think, are really our mainstay of treatment. But if it's these subtle changes in population, um, again, antibiotics may be useful, but we have to kind of know what the downstream consequences are as well. I think when we get to more end-stage liver diseases or more severe liver diseases, um, again, antibiotics can be helpful and we may not be as worried because, again, it's a risk-benefit um, balance. Great questions.